morning, everyone. Uh, hope you're here for the right reason to talk about the education employment <laughs> gap. Um, mind the gap. We've got a great set of panelists here to talk about just that, starting all the way down at the end. Uh, Raj uh, from the University of Illinois. And Byron from Opportunity at Work uh, right, right, right next to him. And then Rick Levin uh, from Coursera here. And Matt uh, Siegelman from uh, Burning Glass uh, Technologies, uh, uh, posing as a local Bostonian with me, but not actually. So. Uh, uh, it's good to have you all here, though, on the panel. What, what I, what I want to do is basically break this panel up into three mini-conversations. The first one, basically a lightning round, where they all talk about their actual work and how they came to uh, the conclusion that the uh, uh, education employment gap was something really worth solving, uh, and how they think about that problem. And then from there, to dig in deeper. Uh, around some of the uh, questions about how you attack that, what are the actual issues, what can actors do to influence this. And then uh, the last couple minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll come up a level uh, and think about where this goes in the uh, future and, and predictions for how this shakes out. So we'll, we'll dive in, and, and Raj, maybe I'll start with you. Um, not everyone would, uh, would say someone from a, a traditional university yes. uh, would, would, would attack the education and employment gap. So the question for all of you that I'd love to run down is just describe what you actually all are doing uh, in this Perfect. space and, and give people a concrete sense of it. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for this opportunity. And as you rightly said, uh, it is uh, very rare to find a university-affiliated person here in addressing the employment uh, business mismatch. But uh, to give a bit of a background, I manage and oversee the uh, a graduate uh, space in business education. And when you think about traditional business schools, they always look at uh, two different segments in the, in the graduate space at least. You know, you have the full-time segment where people do their, uh, uh, after their undergraduate work for a couple of years, three years, come back to school, and then, or uh, people with uh, a lot more working experience go into the professional and the executive MBA program. Of course, we have uh, our executive education as well. But one of the things that have, we have noticed at the University of Illinois in the last four or five years is there are two concurrent trends that are happening. The nature of work is changing, and the nature of the worker is changing. Uh, when I, uh, you know, uh, so when I talk about the nature of the worker, you know, we have interesting statistics where people come in and have multiple job changes anywhere from 6 to 13 over their lifetime. And, and the question that we asked ourselves is, are we uh, uh, catering uh, to this particular segment of people? You know, we, we catch them twice, if possible, in the undergraduate and the graduate, and then for 40, 50 years, we have absolutely no connection to them. So uh, in a nutshell, what we are doing, uh, last year we announced a program with Coursera, uh, the first online MBA, MOOC-based uh, online MBA. Apart from the degree-seeking side, one of the things that we are doing is catering to the, the lifelong learner, the fractional learner, if you will, by offering uh, courses. For instance, 20 years ago, we didn't have digital marketing. 20 years ago, we didn't have 3D printing specialization from a business point of view. So we are, I think, uh, if I may say so, we are using it cleverly. There are certain courses within the university rubric that we are offering for credit from a fractional learning perspective, but certain courses like what I talked about, the digital learning and 3D printing, we are offering in the non-degree space, if you will, and uh, 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 trying to le reach this lifelong learner segment. So that's what we do. Great. Byron? Uh, so Opportunity at Work is a, uh, a social enterprise uh, we launched about a year ago. Um, uh, the tagline is rewire the US labor market. Uh, the, the theory underlying it is that when you think about the education to employment transition, uh, a lot of us, including myself, have focused for years on the education side of it, the supply side, but that actually, if you look at the demand side, the employment side of that transition, um, it, it's actually, uh, in a lot of ways, it's broken. And it has certainly changed far more dramatically than higher education has in the past 20 or 30 years. So when you follow that thread, um, what you conclude is that, or what we concluded anyway, was that to, to actually make a difference here, um, you need to uh, sort of, well, rewire in the sense that you need three things to work differently. And we have uh, a 10 year roadmap uh, where we intend to help uh, to enable at least a million more Americans to work and earn to their full potential. And the three part roadmap is first a critical mass of employers to hire 
uh, based on demonstrations of skills, right? So if you can do the job, you can get the job, which is there's a hundred reasons why that's not true today. And it needs to be true for more people for this whole thing to work. The demand side, the demand signal has got to be there in a genuine way. Secondly, um, uh, you need the educational, the, the learning pathways, um, and you need a multiplicity of them. But you also need uh, a kind of a common place they can land so that uh, when you choose one pathway, you're not kind of going down an alley where you don't know where it leads and you can never get back. So we're trying to create really a space where uh, uh, along with that hiring, if you have a critical, sufficiently critical mass of hiring, then you should be able to define, if you get to this level of skills, you will be able to get a job. You will get a job. Can't say it's this company, that company, the other, but you will, and that there are many pathways to get there depending on where you started, but there's a target to shoot at. That's the learning pathway piece. And once you've got that wired and you've got transparency around it, as a good market should have, um, then there'll be tremendous opportunities uh, for talent financing not based on the kind of uh, checklist uh, compliance uh, with no judgment of the current student loan system, nor based on FICO, where the poorer you are, the more you pay, or the least access you have, but where you can actually finance based on uh, kind of talent fit and institution and align those incentives. So that's the play. We're focused first on information technology occupations, which are about uh, one-sixth of open jobs. And under the tech hire brand, which you may have heard of, got 50 cities, well, cities, regions, uh, some are rural, some small states, um, sign, uh, that are participating, because again, it's an ecosystem play. About 1,000 employers are participating uh, now. Uh, techhire.org, you can check out how that's uh, evolving. About 200 uh, education training institutions and a number of community partnerships. Um, we expect about uh, 5,000 uh, people to be placed into jobs they otherwise wouldn't have had a chance at uh, this year. Um, but uh, the goal is much higher, as I, as I mentioned. So that's what we're doing. All right. Rick. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Rick Levin. I'm the CEO of Coursera, which is the world's largest um, platform for massive open online courses. Um, I, we're tackling the, we are, the, we have found the, 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 the skills gap and essentially making a match between what universities offer and what workplace needs are is is exactly our sweet spot at this point. I mean, while we do cater to all kinds of needs, we have uh, courses from 140 university partners that, that touch all aspects of human knowledge. Um, th the ones that focus on giving people job relevant skills are the ones that people that effectively our learners are most interested in, most willing to pay for. And actually we're engaged, we're engaged with everybody on this panel um, in an interesting way. I mean, we use burning glass data to help figure out where the content, you know, what kind of content will be relevant to job market needs. We look for the areas of excess demand for labor and where, uh, such as data science and data analytics, where, where there's a huge gap and, and that's been a really important part. We've been building out curriculum in, in that area. Um, we're working with Byron and Opportunity at Work to, to see if our, our content can be used in some of the community partnerships that, that Opportunity at Work is building. Um, uh, and of course, uh, Raj is one of our star content suppliers, because Illinois is doing both exactly what he said, right. the first online degree, but also a couple of our key specializations, which are giving people modern job relevant skills, the kind of things they wouldn't have learned in school when they went to school. And so this, the hypothesis is the same. Job, the nature of work is changing. Um, new skills are in demand all the time and people change jobs all the time. And so we wanna be right at the center of that, uh, offering great high quality content and curated learning pathways that will help people uh, uh, get what they need. I'm connected to Mike too. I was his, I was, he was my Yale Daily News reporter a long time ago. <laughs> So, so if, I, if I slip into President Levin at some point, you'll know why, but uh, <laughs> Matt. So uh, at Burning Glass, we think quite a bit about the skill gap, but when we think about the skill gap, uh, we think of it actually really as an information gap. Uh, simply put, supply can't meet demand when supply doesn't know where demand <laughs> is. Um, demand can find the supply that it needs when it doesn't know what talent is out there and where and how to, to tap into talent pools that they're not used to tapping into. Um, the, essentially, what we're left with is a market where everyone's groping around in the dark, not able to find one another. Um, and the pain points are, are legion and well known to this room. 
Um, but what's most striking to us is that that pain is avoidable. Um, it's not that the signals aren't there in the market, it's that we're not reading them. So what burning glass does is uh, we go out and we pick up those signals. We, we collect literally millions of job postings every day. Um, and at the same time, we touch a quarter of a billion uh, resumes a year. Um, and most importantly, then we do, because as you can imagine, um, an associate at McKinsey and an associate at Walmart are not the same thing. And so there's um, <laughs> a lot of opportunities to get this stuff wrong. And so um, the associate at Walmart probably on a per hour basis makes more. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, things to buy. <laughs> um, but that said, um, you know, getting this stuff right is really hard. Um, and it's that ability not only to collect the data, but to actually translate it back to a common language that lets us understand exactly where is demand. What are the jobs, community by community, sector by sector, that are in demand? What are the skills, both technical skills, but also the foundational or soft skills that those jobs require? Um, and what are the certifications, the qualifications that employers are asking for? What are they not asking for? Um, and we serve that up both to employers and to, um, to job seekers, the two parts of, uh, or, or to learners and, and the schools that serve them uh, just importantly, um, the two ends of that um, job market spectrum. Uh, when it comes to employers, um, really this is about um, helping them. They use our data to essentially start to think, how do they navigate the market um, more strategically? used to, to essentially buying talent on the spot market. You need to go out and, you know, I post up a, a job, I'm, I'm essentially pasting up fly paper, and I'm hoping the flies will land, and when they don't, I say, well, gee, I've got a skill gap. And ultimately, skill gaps are creatures of our own creation if we don't um, actually develop a supply chain for the talent that we need, and so that takes an understanding of what are, um, what are markets, where are places where the market's working well, where is it not going to work well, what are the pain points, when there's a pain point, are there other job communities that I can tap, talent pools that I can tap, and what's the skill gap that needs to be closed for that talent? On the other side, um, we work with a range of folks in the content world, um, proud of the work we do with Coursera, also with a range of uh, higher education institutions um, to be able to understand what are the programs, the content that, that really is gonna fill those white spaces in the market, and then how do you articulate its value to learners? Good. So I'm, I'm curious, and, and Byron, I'm going to start with you because you just made a dig at McKinsey and you're an ex-McKinsey guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, personally, how did you guys come to this journey? Because you all come from places that don't make it the most obvious next step um, uh, in, in, in sort of career progression. So personally, <laughs> How did you come uh, to this story of, of, of this gap? And I think it's worth sharing that. Yeah, well, I, 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 for me, I, I, mean, I have intellectual journey and I, and then a, that can then connected to sort of a personal uh, kind of background. I mean, uh, I, I, I uh, co-founded an organization called Hope Street Group, which, which uh, a number of people here have been part of, uh, uh, I don't know, but was that 12 years ago, 15 years ago, and started working on uh, how do you solve how do you take the, the, the kind of the, the expertise, the problem solving capacity in our broader uh, society uh, to rather than just government, you start looking at it. Um, uh, it's, it's funny, I worked on K-12 education and when I, as I dug into it I thought, wow, uh, this is a mess, there's a lot of things, there's so many things wrong with it, it's incredibly unequal, um, you know, the incentives are all messed up, et cetera. Worked on that for quite a while, uh, uh, still do some, um, I, I, I kind of, got into higher, started looking at higher education a little bit, but of course the assumption I had coming in is, oh, K-12, that's a mess, but higher education, what a great system, and then like our labor market, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's the pride of the world, I mean, Europe's like, you know, eurosclerosis, the U.S. is so dynamic, blah, 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 so I then went into search, started, I edged into higher education, and then discovered that higher education had a 50% dropout rate, not a 15% like uh, K-12, um, that higher education was far more unequal uh, even than K-12, I would argue, and that the two main business models, setting aside like what everyone's sort of professional responsibility is and the passion they put into their work, the two main business models in higher education are number one, exclude as many people as you possibly can, that's right. right? And that's where you get to the top of the selectivity rankings, right? I mean, that's the, look at the, look at the US News and World Report algorithm, right? Rejection rate is 
basically the number one thing and it's correlated with everything else. Um, the second business model is butts and seats, right? That's the non-selective business model. And if a butt falls out of a seat, get another butt in that seat as fast as you can, right? So this is the thing that we all believe is so uh, critical you know, to access to opportunity. And it's a it, bigger mess than K-12, right? So at least the labor market, right? At least that's gonna sort it all out. Well, but then as it got further into that, um, and you start to see these patterns, and actually, you know, Matt and Burning Glass uh, really uh, put me onto this whole uh, credentialization, where now we have, you know, two thirds of jobs for secretaries require a bachelor's degree even to apply, even though only 20% of today's secretaries have a bachelor's degree. And there's a bunch, but when you start to add up the labor market stuff, I mean, we're creating this massively structurally inclusionary system where the most valuable things you can learn, you can only learn at work, but we're defining access to work by dint of what you've done through the job description, what you've done the last 10 or 20 years of your life, and no one's invented a time machine yet. So basically, we've got a market that is structurally excluding people, and in a lot of ways, that demand side is even worse than higher ed. And again, this is sort of, this is stuff where I didn't start out this journey believing those things, but the more I looked at it, the more I realized you really had to start there and work your way back which then made a lot of sense of a lot of things I'd seen in my life, because I have a huge extended family um, that spans the socioeconomic spectrum from dire third world poverty to basically me. And uh, I know that there is a massive variance between uh, the talent, the motivation, you know, the energy people have to, to accomplish things and what they end up with in life. And there's these very kind of, these sort of structural differences make a, a massive difference. So once, uh, once you realize it, or at least once I realized it, I, I, I kind of couldn't do anything else. So here I am. Rick, you're the selective side of this. So before Coursera. Yeah. Well, I was, as, as I think probably people know, president of Yale for 20 years, and before that, professor of economics at Yale for 20 years. And um, uh, actually, I, you know, this was, I, I mentioned this a bit in the morning session, so forgive me for repeating myself, but. Um, you know, the journey for me toward this problem um, came with the discovery that um, that actually our, our great highly selective universities were not fulfilling their missions. And, and, I, and I, as soon as sort of the possibility of online education came to be visible, which is in the late 90s, um, I, I, I recognized this and did a startup with Stanford and Oxford where we started experimenting with online education. And when I say not fulfilling our mission, it's really simple. The great universities, the ones that are most highly selective, as, as um, Michael Crow was explaining um, uh, to us this morning, uh, it, it, it incorporate the notion of you know, highly selective teaching institutions with great world-class research institutions. They do both. And if you look at the, go look at the mission statement, uh, any one of the top 50 universities in America, and it will say something like this, that, that you know, our mission is to augment human knowledge through research and disseminate it through publication and teaching. Okay, so we're all doing pretty well at augmenting knowledge through research. We, we uh, increasingly publish for narrower and narrower audiences of specialists. Um, uh, you know, in many fields, having a hundred people cite your work would be great. Um, the, the, and then we teach these highly selected numbers of students. Why? You've got the greatest minds in the world at places like Yale and the University of Illinois, and, and I mean, the leaders in their fields globally, and they're teaching 15-person seminars, and they're maybe teaching a one 100-person lecture course once a year. I mean, what a waste of talent. So put these people on the internet, get them on your mobile phones, and let them share their knowledge with the world. It's a, it's a redefinition, or at least a reinterpretation, of the mission of disseminating knowledge. And, uh, and to me, I mean, I thought it was great, and when we got the opportunity to do open educational uh, courses with the benefit, with support from the Hewlett Foundation, um, uh, in the in the middle of the last decade, we made 45 you know just ca classroom capture type lecture courses that had that you know were were attracting tens of thousands of 
of learners, not the scale of Coursera, but, and not interactive and not a really quality learning experience, but it made clear, and the professors loved it. You know, the prof I mean, all of a sudden, I've got a classroom with tens of thousands of people and not, and not 10. And you know, it, it, it's meaningful to the, to the faculty to be able to reach more people. So that's, that, that's sort of my journey here. And the labor market part you know, just came when you recognized you're reaching people long after they went to college and they have needs that are really important to their lives and careers. Um, you know, when I first came to Burning Glass 14 years ago, um, I looked at this really as a um, we. I looked at this really as a data problem, um, and that was it. Um, and here's um, and here's specifically what I was uh, was focused on. Um, you know, burning glass uh, at the time was essentially meeting employers where they were, which is um, around supporting their hiring process. Okay, I'm receiving thousands of applicants. How do I? Um, use uh, data and analytics to be able to, to stack rank them more effectively so that I don't have to read a couple thousand applicants. Fair enough. Um, and at a certain level, there's need to be able to deal with the transactional part of, uh, of the job market. Um, but very quickly, when that's your business, you realize that actually you're in the business of helping employers say no, um, of not filtering talent in but filtering talent out. Um, and um, that approach to talent of, okay, well, um, you think of it as an assembly line with somebody who's going, no, 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 yes, no, no, um, is um, an incredible waste of potential talent. Um, it's not providing any kind of feedback <coughs> back. It's not providing any, um, uh, any sense for how you actually can elevate some of the people who may not have every single one of the skills that you're looking for. Um, and so that was started to be something that was increasingly weighing in our mind. And one of the other things we realized is that, frankly, even if we want to just focus on serving our employers, uh, our, our employer customers where they are, um, that we weren't serving them well if all we did was help them filter. Because the reality is that um, the world is talent short. Um, even in you know, the depths of the recession around really skilled fields, the world was talent short. It's more talent short today. Um, and so um, increasingly in a lot of fields, you were having to say a lot of no's precisely because um, you were waiting for the fly uh, flies to wait on the fly pen, fly, uh, <laughs> the right flies to wait, land on the fly paper or whatever it is. Sorry, I'm tongue tied today. Um, so we came to realize that ultimately, if we wanted to serve our employers better, if we wanted to be able to serve that talent um, better, that we needed to actually step back from this and to connect this with what's going on in the broader job market, because that's how you can actually start to be more strategic. If you can understand the market, you can plan for it, you can connect more eff efficiently and effectively. Uh, Three, four years ago, we started on this journey of uh, starting an online MBA uh, for competitive considerations, et cetera. But two things happened along the journey. One was, uh, by happenstance, we had offered via Coursera a course called Subsistence Marketplaces, which reached out to uh, people around the world. And there was one student, and we were looking at Coursera initially, and Rick, this might come as a shock to you, as Coursera as a platform for spotting talent now I've changed, but uh, <laughs> you are much more than that. But, but one of the things was, there was one student was fabulous. We approached the student and said, could you come in and, and if you are interested in doing an MBA, you could do it. And the student said, no, nah, I can't. I am a refugee in a particular country. I actually bicycle 10 kilometers a week to go to this cyber cafe, and, and this is basically what it is. This was a moment that you know, it's one of those things that, as Schopenhauer says, life, a lot of uh, random occurrences, but when you look back, there is a systematic arc. This was one of those things. Uh, how a very uh, important, uh, uh, you know, how we, we change the life of this uh, particular uh, person, and we actually now are responsible for refugee education, using that and so on. The second point was my conversation with Daphne, Daphne Kohler of Coursera. She asked a very simple question to us in our earlier meeting. What is your core competency? What is it that you do well? Which made us think about 
you know, we have always had a degree centric view, all, all universities, right? And there is, a, there is a specific reason for that. Because degree, you know, face to face, there is a constraint in terms of space. The production of a lecture in, is inseparable from the consumption. So you are, you are, you know, uh, you are constrained, if you will. But, but at the end of the day, uh, and therefore for stability of cash flow, you want degree seeking students, etc. But when technology is out there, technology can obliterate all these constraints. But the one thing that's stopping us from a university point of view is our lack of imagination. And, and so we asked ourselves, are we in the degrees and credentials we hold very close to our heart because they are our crown jewels. But at the end, and that is where the exclusivity comes in. But at the end of the day, for us, at the University of Illinois, we were uh, straying too much away from our core mission, which is a land grant mission of democratizing education. And therefore, this was an epiphany for us, which basically said, we are in the knowledge business, and anybody, and we are fantastic content providers. Universities have been doing this for thousands of years. And therefore, we need to go back to our roots. And, and that's where our journey started, you know, to, to look at both degree and non-degree spaces, if you will. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, the, the, what is the job that we are doing to enhance the life of that student, and 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 here we are. So, so I'm curious. At conferences like this, uh, there's almost a consensus that the customer, uh, the end customer of post-secondary education, broadly defined, uh, are our employers. That's not the conventional view within traditional higher ed. So the question is a fewfold. What will it take to move traditional higher ed along the journey that you all have taken? Is that the right question, or, or will they ever make the shift and we're going to see innovative providers come up into the space to make that journey? And I'll, I'll say we're, we're shifting into the second part, so I'd if there's disagreements, I'd love you guys just to talk that out and, and, and me fade in and, and listen to this conversation. But I'd be a little careful with that, um, and here's why. Um, this is one of these places, one, maybe one of the few places in life where that, uh, that Selfridges thing of the customer being always right may not be... Um, may not actually play out. Um, now, whether or not we think about the employer as a customer or whether this is a dual customer system, um, I think uh, is, is subject to debate. Um, but we talk a lot today about demand-driven education. Um, how do we make sure that we're aligning training to what employers are asking for? And, and certainly that's incredibly important. I'd be the last person to say that we should be ignoring demand. Um, on the other hand, um, what we see time and again in the market is that employers um, don't always ask for what they need. Um, you know, it, we see um, a, a lot of cases, and, and Byron talked about this before, um, about um, just the, the sheer um, uh, enormity of this credentials creep that's been going on to the point that in some fields the difference between the percentage of people who, in working in the workforce today who have college degrees in a given job um, can be 40 points off the percentage of what employers are looking for going forward. And so then you have to step back and say, well, maybe this is that work's getting more sophisticated. You need to have a, you know, a higher degree in order to do it. And there were a few occupations that we looked at where there were significant differences between the skill ask um, at the BA level uh, versus the skill ask at the sub-BA level, but that was the exception. Um, in the vast majority of occupations that we looked at that were formerly middle skill occupations, um, and I'd say they still are even if you now require a college degree because arose by any other name. Um, um, but um, what, we, what you see is that the skills are the same. The work that's being described is the same. So it says is that employers in that case are, um, are relying on a proxy, and it's a really costly, really inefficient proxy. And so a lot of the opportunity here, um, you know, whether it's for non-traditional providers like Coursera, um, whether it's for America's um, you know, uh, un unrecognized and unsung gem in its community college system, um, to be able to say, hey, look, are you, do you really need that? Um, will you, can you more efficiently and more effectively, if these are the skills you're looking for, if I can provide something and, and it's taking you 60, 90, 100 days to fill this job, is there a better way to fill it? Um, is there a way that's more efficient? And the good news is that I think employers are rational. Um, they just haven't had the data 
and haven't had that challenge. And so I think there's a big opportunity here um, to, um, you know, to, to, if employers are the customer, to make sure that we're giving them um, not what they say they need, but what they really need. I, I think actually this employers as the customer thing is at the heart of the problem with the, the labor market. I, I don't even want to go into the philosophical issues of uh, you know, liberal arts versus, I, I think there's something more fundamental. Just take this market analogy seriously. If employers are the customers in the labor market, they're the worst customers the world has ever seen. I mean, think about it. Like they, I mean, I was trying to compare it to healthcare, um, but it's actually worse than healthcare. In healthcare, you've got a payer, right? Kind of government or you know the insurers who pay, and that's disconnected. Because I mean, the the person who's benefiting or should be benefiting from healthcare is the patient. The person who should be benefiting from education is the is the student. Um, uh, in healthcare, often it's someone different paying for it. Uh, but in employment, it's even worse. The the employer's not even paying for it. It's like if Boeing uh, wanted to like order, you know, it, it wanted fasteners and for its planes and ball bearings and sub assemblies, and it said to like the fasteners people, "Hey, you know, we're making some planes over here, so um, if you got some fasteners, you might want to send them our way." And they're like, "Oh, uh, oh, what kind of fasteners do you want?" Oh, you know, well, just send over what you got. Um, well, like, how much are you how much are you going to pay us for it? Oh, us pay you? Oh no, we're not paying you. Just, you know, we got some fasteners, send them our way. We, we, get, we use fasteners from time to time. Like, would you fly on a plane that was built that way? I wouldn't. But, like, that's the way the labor market works. If you say an employer is a customer, they don't pay, right, for the production of those skills, typically. I mean, there are exceptions. Well, but they, but they, just, just to push on the analogy, they, right, they, they do they pay in yeah. the sense that they finance the salaries that repay the debt that these students are taking on for the higher ed. Very indirectly, and they do it but they do it without, like, with very poor correlation to like what actually you know what what the the skill thing is, and not based typically on skills too. So there's a separate issue about the signals and how good quality is the degree. But I think it's I think it's a, the market structure is a problem, and I'm not saying that we change it all around employers paying, but I'm saying that's why you need different kind of intermediary institutions to to solve this problem. But, uh, you know, I, I think there's a confusion here. The, 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 the employer is not the customer in the in, 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 in when the product is education or learning or training. The employer is, is, the, you know, is, the, is the buyer in the labor market. Right. And individuals invest in their education. Our, our customer at Coursera is the learner, not the, not the employer. And, and you know that person is gaining skills that they need to go on to, to, to equip them for the labor market. And what's, what's great about what's happening is by breaking down what, you know, um, you know, the traditional reliance on simply degrees as the signal, we can now have certificates or smaller credentials become the signal of the relevant competency that helps employ, gives information to employers in terms of hiring. So I think that's the, that, that, that's, that's the way I conceive of it. I also think it's really important to recognize that the only thing that universities do is not educate people for jobs. It, right. they, they play a much more fundamental social role of educating people for citizenry and for productive lives in, in multiple dimensions. The same year that I joined, you know, six months before I joined Coursera, I saw the launch of, an, of a small liberal arts college that I co-founded in Singapore, and, and which, was de, which was designed to, to demonstrate to Asia the value of an unspecialized liberal arts education, informing citizens and flexible problem solvers who were acquainted with multiple disciplines and who could be leaders of society whether in the business world or, or the political world or, 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 or the education sector or anywhere. And w essentially the model of the American Liberal Arts College, which, um, which is, is seen in Asia where, you know, where, where, training, where education is highly oriented toward you know, narrow specialization and vocation, to, uh, seen, seen as, a, as something that they're missing. And, and so I, let's not, let's not Overemphasize, you know, the labor market is the sole object of higher education. It's not. There's a lot. There's a lot more going on. I concur with uh, the panelists here. To me, 
from a university point of view, we have a civil compact with, uh, we have a compact with the civil society for long-term overall well-being of our students. And, uh, and I say this from a personal experience as well. You know, I come from India. Uh, I went into mechanical engineering. I did four years of mechanical engineering because I thought that was the, uh, uh, the best thing to do uh, and, and, and get a job, etc. cetera. And uh, six months into it, I realized it was an unmitigated disaster. And uh, I completed it. And uh, then, you know, uh, uh, obviously, uh, y you know, long-term overall well-being and happiness, in my opinion, cannot be compared, cannot be connected to these transactive outcomes. So as a university, uh, this is from Marisa Meyer, who has apparently a placard in our, on our desk, which says, success is not about what you know. Success is about how you think. And as a, as a university, our job is to build better thinkers. This is not to downplay the skills that you are going to require. And I, I think of it as a skills to knowledge continuum. And there are many people that are, you know, the many players in the market that are going to uh, capture uh, uh, small segments of the market, et cetera. From a university point of view, we would like to be in the knowledge business, into the thinking business. And, and, and of course, this is not to say that there is there should be no connection to the labor market. That's the way I, I think about it. You know, the, the, the problem is this, and I, I certainly I don't think there'd be very many people in this room who would disagree that universities shouldn't be teaching people how to think, shouldn't be um, preparing people for a full career, and, and shouldn't be helping people right. um, be fulfilled. But part of being fulfilled is certainly um, having not just a job but a career. Um, yeah, is sure. being able to uh, pay down your debts. We now know that about 40% um, of student loans are non-performing, which is not surprising when the car's up on cinder blocks in the yard, you don't pay your car loan. Um, and um, uh, there's a, um, an important obligation for universities not only to provide those foundational skills that Richard talked about, but also to make sure um, that they are providing um, in all kinds of programs, um, if not directly within the program, then on the peripheries of the program, access to uh, awareness of, first of all, what the kind of the, the job market skills that people are going to need to have to get a job when they graduate, and access, again, either through the program or through um, supplementary content, such as the kind that Coursera offers or a range of others offer, um, to being able to acquire the skills that are going to help you get a job. If we send people out and say, hey, well, we've taught you how to think. Um, you're now on your own, um, the job market is increasingly unforgiving. Um, and um, education is increasingly expensive, and so we need to make sure that this isn't an either or and that it's a both. We're going to teach the labor market how to be more forgiving so that the philosophy major is able to take business foundations courses mm -hmm. or data science courses or things on Coursera while they're in school. Right. So when they leave school, they've got the benefits of this broad liberal education and some job relevant skills. Uh, I, that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the vision and, I have. And I think that's a great vision. But I think, right. we're, I think when we talk about uh, technical skills versus general, I, we're, we're, we, we tend to talk about it in a pretty confused way. We tend mm -hmm. to assign it based on disciplines. We say like engineering is a sort of technical skills and you know medieval literature is a you know, of kind of a thinking thing, but I, I don't think that's the right way to look at it at all. I mean, you can learn, you need critical thinking, yeah, and research skills, sure. you know, uh, yeah, epistemology, like how do you know if something is true? What do you know? You know, those things matter a lot in any sphere of life, in the workplace, in your, in your life. So these skills can be taught in engineering, they can be taught in medieval literature, but at a certain point, detailed uh, knowledge of medieval literature is a vocational skill. It's a vocational. It's a vocational set of knowledge that is only applicable um, in a narrow set of vocations in the university. Right. So I think uh, a university should be just as responsible if it's going to have 80 people studying medieval literature to be damn sure that they have a path to like 80 professors' jobs in medieval literature. And if they're not, that's irresponsible. And I think that's the same thing that if you're teaching writing computer science to make sure you're teaching something where there's relevant skills for the labor market today. I don't think it's a disciplinary question. I think it's how do you make sure, and then on the employer side, how do you recognize those most fundamental skills, which if you push on it, employers will all say those matter most, but how do they recognize it? Because they're screening out a lot of people before they have a chance to show and demonstrate those skills. So, so, so digging, 
you're all sort of hinting at this question of actually digging in b below the degree into the actual competencies that employers want. There's two problems with that, though. One, universities and, and post-secondary are not structured around competencies often. Um, and, and I would push it further. While universities are in the knowledge business, they're not necessarily in the learning business, historically. Um, and, and there is a difference. Um, and, and then the, the second part of it is employers are actually, ex not only are they inarticulate about the signals and, and, and causing the distortion there, but they actually don't really know the skill sets that they even want to hire for in the, employers, in, in the employees. Because, and my friend Boris Saxberg's in the audience here who talks about this all the time, experts are unbelievably inarticulate about 75% of what they actually know and do that are critical to being an expert in a, in a given field. So it's hard to express that for them. Uh, so I, I, we're starting to drive toward this, but is data alone going to start to bridge that gap? Or if it's off of false signals in some sense, does it lead us astray? Like, how do we solve that problem and move us toward a deeper recognition of what those true competencies are? Well, some of it comes down to the question of, you know, what are data? Um, and, you know, data themselves, I mean, it's actually the plural of datum, which means something which is given. Um, employers are giving an honest um, expression of what they think they need. Now, we can debate whether or not they know what they need, um, and, and there's a lot of reasons to say that they don't. Um, but at the end of the day, the data um, uh, are clear. The real, the, where you can trip up is, is whether you, is the level at which you're interpreting them, the level at which, uh, and the accuracy with which, which you bring to identifying what that signal says. Now, um, the reality is, on the one hand, while employers um, aren't certainly providing a comprehensive inventory of what they need when they, they talk about a job, but at the same time, we're actually, employers tend to be very specific and very consistent across employers within different kinds of jobs is around what they're not getting, right? You, you don't see a job posting that says, I'm looking for an attorney, must have a JD, must be admitted before the bar. You don't need to. Um, you say, I'm looking for an attorney, you can actually read a financial statement or whatever it is that you need. Um, and in those kinds of ways, employers tend to be actually quite specific and quite consistent. And that ultimately is perhaps more impactful as we think about what it, where it is that the system's going awry, because what it's telling us is what are the things that we're not teaching that we really need to? Where are the places where we've that's created right. pain points? And then frankly, that's how the data help us. Same way, I think employers do have a sense of what the, what the competencies are they need. Where they aren't so clear, and we've started actually now um, talking to companies and selling you know, licenses into companies to, to, take our, to take our courses. And what we find is they actually need us to help them a lot with the mapping from the competencies they need to the actual courses that supply them. And frankly, the faculty teaching the course, th this is how this is, what you identify yeah. is going to change because, because um, you know, increasingly we, we will need our professors to focus more on actually explaining what competencies does this course deliver. Right. And so that's going to be, that'll be an improvement in the information flow. As in you'll push the faculty we'll, to teach exactly. on the course platform. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, we, what you said, we're good at, we're good at, um, at uh, knowledge, at, but not necessarily at learning. Another thing the online technologies are doing is bringing data back to instructors at previously unimagined that's scales right. so that they can test hypotheses about teaching, and they do every day because they look at the data on how are students doing on a particular quiz or in a particular area, and they realize, hey, I'm not getting across now. So I can go in and I can edit the questions. I can go in and I can edit the lecture. So, so to actually improve teaching in a way that would, would have taken years in a classroom format. You know, oh yeah, the kids got stuck on consumer surplus this year. Well, I'll do it differently next year. And maybe three years from now, I've got the right answer. But, you know, on Coursera, you can get that answer in three weeks which is awesome. I, I, I think that the, well, the approach we're taking in, in Tech Hire is to really say um, you've got to uh, essentially eliminate the screening based on pedigree and brand and, and, and really make it demonstrations of, of competence. Um, good employers are pretty good by the time they get to the final round, like last four or five candidates, and really knowing what they want and what they're looking for. They're not perfect, but it's not bad. You know, uh, if you can get to audition for uh, a symphony orchestra, at least if it's a blind audition, you're probably going to get a very fair shot 
at Are You the Best One There? But how many people can make it right to the audition, and how will they be screened uh, before they before they get there? And so the the opportunity we have now with technology is not just in the way we learn, but in the way we demonstrate what we learned. And um, there's a very I think positive trend towards competency-based education in higher education. But if we don't change the way employers work, that's going to hit a brick wall because if employers are screening based on uh, pedigree, uh, and it is going to, right, the competency, ba that's not going to, to sort of make the same traction. But we now have an opportunity to do essentially demonstrations of competency, uh, capstone uh, projects, portfolios of work, and drive that all the way back through into education. So to take software development, for example, if you want to know if someone uh, can code, it's pretty silly now to look at their, their transcript or their resume, look at their GitHub, look at their code, right? And you can, and to, to have sort of software that, that actually helps semi-automate part of that screening, but based on what you can do, and then if you have the, the work actually being done all through the learning process, whether in school or out of school, represented there, that is going to give us a much better way of, of actually opening up like a much more inclusive uh, opportunity to, to talent. And so what we're trying to do in all the information, I mean, it's easier in software development, it's more straightforward, but we're trying to do that in all uh, categories. So you'd end up in some areas with simulations, right? If you want to sort of argue a good network administrator where you, you have a certificate that might mean something more or less, but where you can also do simulations, right? How do you, how do you work scenarios, case studies, how do you work through that? And you can, you can do that digitally enough now, uh, and certainly in the future even more so, so that you really will be able to kind of have a very wide opening and let anyone who can get their rise to the top. And the last very critical point is instrument that for people so they can mm. see how close they are, right? So they can see their own gaps. The entire system evaluation right now for hiring is based on helping the employer make the right hire. And essentially, all of their information captured of all the people they don't hire is essentially flushed down the toilet immediately after it's, right? It's not used. That is a crazy, crazy, crazy waste. You give someone technical interview, they pass the technical interview, but they're not the fit that you want so you don't hire them. Uh, well, then no one ever finds out they have the technical skills. Now, if they have a computer science degree from Princeton, that doesn't matter, they'll go into the next one. But if they scrap their way into that interview and they don't have the credentials, they might not ever get another chance to show what they can do. And that's, a, that's an incredibly powerful and clear market signal that's lost entirely today. So these are the sorts of things we need to fix. So quickly, uh, Michael, there is, I think from a university point of view, we need a paradigm shift. Uh, Rick alluded to the uh, slow pace that universities are used to because we have never had the kind of data that we have access to. So I, I personally think this is where entities like Coursera help us. For us, a couple of things have happened actually. You know, we have actually moved from a sage on the stage model to a guide on the side model, if you will. <laughs> And, and when, people, when, when Coursera gives us not only the data, but also here are the competencies, connecting back to your earlier comment, we are now moving from a knowledge-based business to a learning-based business, right? So that is the first part. And the second part that I want to emphasize as far as, uh, one of the things that I always urge universities is to partner with outside entities. We do not, all, we do not have all the answers. And it, it behooves us if we have to worry about uh, the long-term well-being of our students, to go to people like Coursera and Burning Glass who have this data and, and to have a melded approach, if you will. You know, it's not a top-down employees are always right, top-down faculty are always right, but some sort of a hybrid model where we take it and suit it to our, to our needs. And the last two years of our deal, our uh, thing with Coursera, especially with the online learning, it's been a huge learning experience for us, but if I were to summarize it in one thing, universities have to change their paradigms on how they are going to look at this in the long run. So, I see the one minute, uh, one minute remaining. So, uh, change tax as we end this conversation, widening the circle outside of the folks up here on stage. Who are you really excited about that's uh, solving this, this, this problem? I, I, and any lever, uh, level of that actor, right? From government to businesses to individuals, who, who are you excited about solving this? Government of Singapore. Uh, the government of Singapore has is, is, is created a tax credit for people over 25, $500, to, for any kind of 
advanced skills training. So they can go to the local universities or technical schools, but they can also use, deploy it for online learning and we're finding just tremendous responsiveness. It's a great model. It would be a great model for this country to extend the higher education opportunity tax credit to people uh, further along in their careers. I'm really excited actually about the tremendous initiatives that, that um, our current administration have made around transparency. Um, I think if we're going to solve the, the, uh, the gap, we need to make sure that people are empowered with better information and, and I think the efforts um, that this administration has made in that regard is, um, have been tremendous. I was out in Singapore this summer yeah. and, and just last week talking about it. It's incredible. Yeah. I was part of the administration, so I, uh, it's better for you to say that. I, I do actually do think this administration has done uh, a tremendous yeah. amount to move in the right direction, but there's just limits, right, to what a gov government can do. I mean, we should, I, I think there should be more government funding for training. That said, it's right now companies spend 25 times as much on training as government. So even if you double or triple that, the key thing is who gets access to the company training, which is always going to be more market relevant than the government training, right? It's the pathways in that count. The one thing I will say that I'm incredibly fascinated with right now uh, is how to apply uh, game logic um, rather than our current. So our current logic of the labor market, as I mentioned before, is entirely stratifying. It's all about like force ranking, you know, whereas game logic is all about can you get to the next level? Right? And typically you can get there by multiple ways using a, a, a varying mix of strengths, but like the rules are relatively clear and you can, you can get there even in super complex situations. And how do you make our labor market more like that where ultimately you can say, if I work hard at X to learn Y, I can get to job Z, to opportunity Z, et cetera, and that's a better place for me. And if, and if people could know that, and half the labor market today in the US does not have an answer to that question, you would unlock so much energy, so much talent, um, and it would make a huge difference. So I, I think anyone has any ideas or knows people, people who know game logic and want to apply it to this market, go find them and connect them to me or my co-founder, Karan Chopra, over there. So uh, I'm very impressed with the model that is uh, becoming popular, and it's exemplified by the school, Brit School of Management in, uh, in India. Uh, they made a call to start a university uh, business school three, four years ago, decided not to go the degree uh, route, non-degree, but they are curating content from, the, from, from some of the best universities in the world, and they are providing face-to-face -face training, if you will. So in, in my opinion, it's a, it's a great hybrid model. I think this, is a, this business model is going to catch on in the long run. I think of modern universities as a, elite universities as hubs in a hub-and-spoke model where we provide the content and the actual application, if you will, can be done on a face-to-face -face or a virtual setting by these, uh, by these uh, different entities. So that, to me, is, a, is an exemplar of what is coming in the future. Terrific. Well, Raj, Byron, Rick, uh, Matt, please uh, join me in thanking these trailblazers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.